Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. I'm Andrea M and this is Real Crime Down Under. And let me just get off crime topic for a moment to wish you all a very, very, very happy Christmas and a happy and safe new year. This might be my last video before the Christmas festivities start, I'm not sure. I'm going to try and get a highlight video up for you guys of the uh, launch at the Emporium the other day that I told you about the KVC Creations New Gallery and the Rustic Revivals Fashion Parade. Unfortunately, the humidity did mess with a little bit of the filming that I got done that night, so I'm going to have to try and chop it up and make a highlight reel out of it, but it'll just be a quick little reel. That'll be a lot of fun for you guys, so I'll try and get that up after I have this video all done and edited. But I just wanted to take this chance to say thank you so much to everybody who's supported me during the year. I've been sick a lot, I've had a lot of things happen and everybody stuck with me, so that is amazing. And thank you guys all so, so much. And thank you to all of my new subscribers who have recently joined the channel. I have so much coming up for you guys, so I'm really happy that you're here. So today's story is going to be a big case. It has taken me a week to kind of get all the research together and try to condense it down so I don't have a video that goes for a week. So we're going to get into the video right now, but please may I ask you also before we begin, if you've been watching for a while and you're not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Obviously you keep coming back, so you like the content. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. I'm nearly halfway there to my first 1,000 subs, and thank you guys all so much for that. But I still need to get another just over 500 subscribers so that I can get to my first 1,000 subscribers. And that means perks like paid advertisements, paid channel memberships, merch. It also gives me a little bit of an income so that I can upgrade all of my equipment and stuff, which means better videos for you guys, which is what I would really love to do. So if you could please help me out with that, that would be great. Also, please like the video, please drop a nice comment or a discussion in the comment section below. And please always keep it respectful so that we can all enjoy YouTube together. It's much nicer when we all respect each other. Lively debates are encouraged, but please just always be respectful to each other and towards me because it's just a whole heap nicer. That being said, let's get into today's case. And I've been wanting to cover this one for a while, but as with what usually happens here on YouTube with cases that are interesting and do turn out to be popular in their ickiness or whatever you want to call it, it seems to me, and I do do this myself, the worse the case is, the more I want to know about it. Um, and mainly because I want to know that at least some of the victims might have come out of it and are okay now, or that the perpetrators have been caught. So this was a case that did capture YouTube quite a bit. And a few of my colleagues on here had covered this case probably all around about the same time. So I'm not one for stealing other people's thunder, so I decided to wait for a little bit to do this case, but it has been one I've been sitting on for a while and I have been putting a lot of research into and I've tried to condense it as much as I can, as I said. So today's final real crime down under for 2023 is centering around a cult that was created in Australia in the 1960s. And if you are familiar with this case, you probably already guessed who it's gonna be about. So let's just get right on into it. So as I began, today's real crime down under centers around a religious cult founded in the mid 1960s by a woman calling herself, you've probably already guessed this if you are familiar with this case, Anne Hamilton Byrne. The cult would come to be known as the family. And to some, Anne Hamilton Byrne was a yoga teacher with a penchant for plastic surgery. To others, she was the evil leader of an apocalyptic cult and she had more than 500 followers and more than 28 children. And when I say she had more than 28 children, they were not really her children. She led people to believe that all 28 were hers However, they were not. And this is where the atrocities of today's case are centered around with the lives of the 28 children 
and the other people that she more or less sucked in to her beliefs and this sect which became a cult eventually. So some of the children were the children of some of the cult members. Others were newborns that came from unwed mothers tricked into thinking their babies were going to good homes. A few were just out and out stolen and that is from the investigators who worked on the case. So recently some of those children began speaking out about Hamilton Burns' attempt to build a perfect race through a collection of children. So a lot of the literature that I have read for this is like a few years old. So when I say recently, this sort of came out towards probably the end of the late 80s when everything finished into the 90s and the early 2000s. So it's recent-ish. And unfortunately, some of the children have passed away in between the cult being disbanded, well, that branch of it being disbanded. For all intents and purposes, the reports are saying that the family is still alive and well in Australia and still operating somewhere. So I'm hoping that it's not operating to the degree that it was when it was under Hamilton Burns' control. So some of the children began speaking out about her attempt to build a perfect race through the collection of the children. And some of the children were forced to have their hair bleached blonde and were homeschooled on an isolated property and were injected with LSD as part of an initiation ritual. The harsh treatment was carried out by some of the women who were also under Anne Hamilton Burns' control. They were members of the cult and they were known as the aunties. And the aunties were loyal cult members who lived with and taught the children. So, okay, it all sounds great, right? Aunties are usually great people. They take you out for ice cream, to a movie. They buy you stuff your parents wouldn't. Mm -mm. Not in this case. And I'm going to get to why the aunties were so evil and what they did was so atrocious. But I will get to that. These were not an aunt that you would want to have, believe me. So the children believed that they were brothers and sisters and thought that Anne and her husband, Bill Hamilton Byrne, were their parents. And this was right up until they were rescued by the police and the cult was broken up. And the family would also go on to be known as well as an incredible story of determination by a detective in Australia and an agent at the FBI who joined forces to bring Hamilton Burns before a judge. And the detective in question was a gentleman called Lex DeMann, and he was a former detective with the Victorian police. So Lex DeMann would go on to say that his whole life was wrapped up in the investigation. So he would go on to tell reporters from 48 Hours and the correspondent Peter Van Zant that Anne Hamilton Byrne was the most evil person that he had ever met. The family was also known as, and here we go with weird pronunciations again, I'm going to try and get this right, the Santin Ectican Park Association or the Great White Brotherhood as it was also known in Australia and it was also known as the first Australian New Age group and it was, as I said before, formed in the 1960s under Anne Hamilton Burns leadership just so there's no confusion i'm not going to call it that or the great white brotherhood i'm just going to call it the family just to get rid of any confusion so when i refer to the cult or the group or the sect i'm just going to call it the family so anne hamilton Byrne was actually born evelyn grace victoria edwards on the 30th of december 1921 and the group taught a mixture of Western and Eastern religious doctrines with Hamilton Byrne claiming to have been the reincarnation of Christ. Mm -hmm. She had lofty opinions of herself. And this was somebody who started out as like a cleaning woman and a yoga teacher. She had very humble beginnings. She was just like anybody else. But somehow or another, whatever was going on in her head, she came to convince herself and others that she was actually 
the reincarnation of Christ. And it has widely been described that way by the group as well. So the group became the centre of controversy when its compound in Olinda, Victoria was raided by police on the 14th of August 1987 amid allegations of child abuse. All the children were removed from the premises and were discovered to have been adopted through illegal means. Hamilton Byrne and her husband were eventually arrested in 1993 and charged with conspiracy to defraud and commit perjury in relation to the adoption scams. But the charges were eventually dropped. Hamilton Byrne did plead guilty to the remaining charge of making a false declaration and was fined a meagre $5,000. And to you and I, $5,000 for a fine, that's a lot of money. But as the case progresses, you will see that was a mere a drop in the ocean to Anne Hamilton Byrne. That would have been pocket change for her. And you're about to find out why. So as far as these poor children that were under her control was concerned, there were 28 of them, ranging from toddlers to teenagers. And they only learned the truth of their lives much later. And one of the children who was one of the main children under Anne Hamilton Burns' control was a woman named Sarah Moore. And Sarah Moore would go on later to tell media reporters that the cult doctor arranged for my biological mother to be drugged and made to sign an adoption form. Sarah also had believed that Anne was her birth mother and she only learned the truth as an adult. Sarah would also go on to say and just get ready for this. This is very horrific. Um, I can't remember whether or not my colleagues actually covered this part of the case in their video. So you might have heard it before. But if you are new to this case and you haven't heard it before, this is horrific and you need to prepare yourself. So Sarah would go on to say that during her birth, a pillow was put over her birth mother's head and her birth mother was given major tranquilizers. And as soon as Sarah was born, she was taken away instantly. Her mother wasn't even allowed to see her or look at her. So you can imagine Sarah's poor mother, like her mother was a teenage girl with an unwanted pregnancy, maybe. She was, you know, like a teenage girl, frightened, pregnant, probably not knowing what she was gonna do. Even if she had decided that she wanted to surrender her baby to adoption, they should, you know, usually they will let the mother see the baby at least, give her a chance to change her mind because everything changes for a lot of people when the baby's actually born and they're like, okay, that's my child, I'm going to keep it. Sarah's mother didn't have that option. She didn't even get to see Sarah. And this went on a lot during the reign of Anne Hamilton Byrne because like you might be asking okay so how was this allowed the point was Anne Hamilton Byrne had doctors she had lawyers she even had the police in her pocket and that was how she got away with what she did she also had a doctor who ran a psychiatric clinic in her pocket and a lot of people if they came up against Anne Hamilton Byrne or she felt threatened by them they would get referred to this doctor and they would be sent to the psychiatric clinic. But we'll get into that as the case progresses as well. So Sarah Moore would go on to survive her time in the family and she did eventually reconnect with her birth mother in the years following her escape. Anne Hamilton Byrne did have one child of her own. She had a daughter. Thankfully for her own daughter, she was a young adult by the time Anne Hamilton Byrne started her cult. Later on, when Anne was in her 50s, she'd sometimes explain the arrival of new children by telling her followers that she was their biological mother. And this is a woman who is in her 50s. So by then, the whole having babies thing getting pregnant on your own just and who was the father of these children like was was it all supposed to be bill or was it did she 
how did she explain that who the, the the children's father was because he would have been older by that time too that there's no way back then also because they didn't have the medical technologies i'm sure there are older ladies having babies well into their 50s these days back then though we didn't have that technology so there was no way in hell somebody of that age was going to be having children of her own and you have to think there were a lot of children that came into this place and she's tried to claim all of them as her own even a very young woman would never have had time to have that many children and be doing all the things that Anne Hamilton Byrne was also doing but she would tell her followers that she was the children's mother and she even took to wearing maternity clothing around to try and and you know perpetuate the lie that she was the children's mother and she she did a lot of plastic surgery to try and make herself look younger when her hair started to thin she was wearing wigs honestly she was i have to hand it to her in this respect that she was really trying to maintain an image she was putting that work in it's just a shame it wasn't for the power of good rather than what she was doing so another member of the sect or the cult who was a member since childhood was a man named dave whittaker dave whittaker would go on to say that anne told dave that she'd given birth to triplets so dave was also a former child member of the family who was injected with lsd by his own father at the age of 14 and he would also go on to say that she's looked me straight in the face and said i had these three children and Dave was thinking to himself, no, you didn't have these three children. You must think I'm a bloody idiot to tell me that. And that's uh, quoted directly from Dave Whitaker. But Dave was smart and he knew not to question Anne. So she, he just said to her, oh, yes, okay, and agreed with her. And he would go on to say that she's not somebody that you argue with. The children who were adopted by Anne were all given the last name of Hamilton Byrne and for the children growing up in this manner, they just believed that they were brothers and sisters. Anne would even groom the children to resemble each other. As we explored earlier, and you'll see by the photos, that she would bleach their hair white blonde. And you have to think, bleach is a really dangerous substance. And these are children, and some of them were very young children when she bleached their hair. And you know how sensitive like a child's scalp and their skin and everything is that bleach would have burned them it would have burned their little scalps it would have burnt their skin and she did it over and over as soon as their hair would grow out and you could see that they weren't that white blonde she would bleach their hair again and you know i have i've never taken to that bleaching your hair i just bleach it just it kills everything and it's just so bad for your body but here she was bleaching the children to get their hair to that white perfect Aryan shade and we're going to get into that later too believe me Sarah would go on to say that she thought Anne simply said about it as a project you know I'll collect as many kids as I can only she became a leader of a cult and Sarah would also say that she thought that she could get whatever she wanted. And Sarah would say, I think one of the things she wanted was lots of little children. Little perfect children in perfect little dresses with perfect white hair. Another child who was a member of the cult named Adam Lancaster would also say, we all did look the same. We all had blonde bleach hair not all of us some some had red hair because auntie Anne, as he would call her was actually a natural redhead stephen eichel a psychologist and an internationally recognized cult expert said at its peak the family had branches in the united states and multiple countries around the world stephen eichel would also go on to say Anne hamilton Byrne was the leader of what we would call a hybrid new age cult adam lancaster would also say we were brought up that we were brought up to believe that we had had many millions of lives and auntie Anne promised us that this was our last life if we stood by her 
And I can't imagine what that would have been like for those kids. They're their children. I mean, you remember what it's like as a child yourself. You know, just normal stuff like going to church or, you know, you'd be sitting there and you'd be listening to the, the, the priest delivering his sermon or whatever, whatever church you ascribe to if you go. And I got, <laughs> this is actually funny for me, but, I, you know, my grandmother tried to raise me as Catholic. <laughs> well, that didn't work. That's, that's a whole other story not related to this, but you'd be sitting there and the priest would be there. And we actually had a really lovely priest in our parish. He was a lovely man. We all loved him to death. He was great. But <laughs> I never understood a thing he was trying to tell us. And I have to say, my father was a little bit of a religious freak as well. I think if there had been a cult available in the area, he would have been straight to it. And he used to sit down and try to talk to me about stuff like this as a child. And I'd just be sitting there like, I wouldn't have a clue what he was talking about. So I can only imagine what it would have been like for these poor children being brought up in this cult, being drugged, being subjected to violence, trying to understand what the hell this nutcase was trying to tell them. Again, I'm speechless, words fail me. Sarah Moore would go on to say as well, I think she believed that the world would end in some sort of apocalyptic event and that we would be so perfectly trained and so disciplined that we would be able to lead what was left of the world into the next epoch. Anne would also deliver a highly creepy sermon and it would go as quoted, those who are devoted to me, those are united with me. Those who are not devoted, they don't know me. Make of that what you will. So the adopted children lived apart from the adult cult members in an isolated compound near Lake Eildon, about three hours outside of Melbourne. The stark reality behind the images of a carefree childhood, and you'll see some photos here. The children say it was a constant fear of the woman they called mother and the cult women she assigned to take care of them. And this is where we get into what happened at the hands of Anne Hamilton Byrne and the aunties. Leanne Creese lived in the cult from birth until she was 17 years old. And this is Leanne's recounting of what her experience of growing up in the family was like. So Leanne would say the women that looked after us were called aunties. They starved us. They beat us. They did all sorts of horrible things to us. And in the interview with 60 Minutes that I watched in preparation for this case, um, Sarah would tell the reporter and she would show him a bucket. It was a big bucket they used to have. And if you were being naughty or they thought you were lying, they would take you down to this compound where this bucket was oh, Jesus. these cases are so hard sometimes and it was hard to watch when sarah talked about this they would take the children down to this compound they would fill up the bucket they would immerse the children's head into the water and they would hold them there until they were just about out of breath and they would yank them out and ask them again and if they said you know are you lying and they'd say no they put them in again they were waterboarding these children and it didn't matter if the kids were telling the truth or not they would eventually have to say yes to make the torture stop and oh my god uh, I had a similar thing happen to me as a child. I'm not going to go into it here, but luckily for me, I didn't end up with a fear of water from it. But this was like every time that, you know, they'd get caught out in a lie or what they, the adults perceived as a lie, they'd get marched down to this compound and they would get waterboarded. And that's not all that happened to them. Another member of the cult, one of the children, a Nuri Trina Byrne, would go on to say that the aunties were to be avoided at all costs. 
and they sounded like they were pretty frightening figures. Another child who grew up in the cult, Ben Shenton, would go on to say, as someone wet the bed, they'd get cold showers. And one of the youngest girls did not speak until she was around five. At the age of 18 months, Ben Shenton was sent by his mother, a grateful cult member, to live at the children's compound. Ben would go on to say that one of the boys had asthma. He was wheezing and snivelling and sick a lot. So the aunties or the nurses, as they were also known, would put him outside in the cold at night. This is a child with asthma. I'm an asthmatic. One of the worst things for us is extreme cold. We don't do well in extreme heat as well, but the cold is worse. It can trigger an asthma attack. It's midsummer right now. We're in the middle of a heat wave. I still can't sleep with my bedroom window open. In case we do get a sudden temperature drop, it will trigger an asthma attack. Here is a little child who is already sick. And because he was sick, they're putting him out in the cold at night? Honestly, and like I said, I read all these through, I do the research, I watch the documentaries. While I'm reading it, it just hits me again at how awful people can be. And these were children. And she would go on to say in several interviews that she never laid a hand on them, that nobody was harmed. Wow. And Anuri, Trina, Byrne would also say, we could never be sure of what would happen next. We were frightened for each other all of the time. And this is like what I was just mentioning. In the interview I watched by the Australian 60 Minutes reporter, she was asked outright by the reporter interviewing her if she had ever harmed any of the children, to which she would look him right in the face and tell her own bold face lie and say, no, she never did. That was an outright lie. And I have a snippet of the interview here and I warn you now, this woman is creepy, she's cold and she's calculating and she gave me the absolute chills the more she spoke. So I'm going to pop a snippet of that interview in here so you can see the look on the reporter's face and just the void that Anne Hamilton Byrne was. But take a look. The children ever hit? No, I can never say we went out to hit the children, never. Never went out to hit them, but were never they Never hit? hit them, no. You never hit your child? No. You know quite well they can. They can what? Make things up? Kids can make things up. We've all been kids. You were a monster at times. I have nothing to say because I don't feel like one. Are you a monster? I'm not conscious of what you're saying I should be conscious of. Are you a monster? Certainly not. Are you evil? Well, what do you call evil? They hit. Of course they weren't. Because? They were not beaten. Never? Never. You'll have to be pretty good to see through that bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. It's lies. So however evil and calculating Anne Hamilton Byrne was, she had a way of captivate she had a way of captivating her victims and the members of the sect. So another member of the cult, Michael Stevenson Helmer, would say, Anne was waiting for me. She just welcomed me and took me in. We're going to say that she looked at him and he was numb right through to his toes. It would also be said that Anne Hamilton Burns' magnetism and command always seemed to hypnotise some of her followers. Michael would go on to say that it was very hard to put it into words. And he would go on to say that at the time it was the most amazing, wonderful feeling. It was just a feeling of being known and understood. Michael Stevenson Helmer was only 19 years old when he met Anne. So he was at a very impressionable age. And he'd say she just radiated out. If you haven't experienced that before, have you experienced it? trying to make sense of Anne Hamilton Burns magnetism. Even those who later broke away from the family are still awed by Anne's seductive strengths. Adam Lancaster would also go on to say, and here's one of the children from the cult, when Auntie Anne walked into a room, you knew she was there. She had the airs and graces of the Queen of England. Mm, 
I don't remember the Queen of England torturing children, though. Just saying. I don't like people referencing the Queen, comparing her to somebody like this. The Queen was a wonderful mother. She was graces. She was gracious. She was hardworking. And she did not torture people. So I can see, like... She might have carried herself like a beautiful late queen, but she was nothing like Queen Elizabeth, let me tell you that. So this would go on to lead Anne Hamilton Byrne to tell her devoted believers that not only was she the reincarnation of Christ, she had also descended from royalty. Mm -hmm. Adam would say, we as children thought she was beyond the Queen of England. There was one time where mum said that she even spent time with the queen having cups of tea. So naturally, kids would be impressed by that. So they just assumed that Auntie Anne was in the same league as Queen Elizabeth. But let me tell you, she was not. Leanne Crease, another of the children, said we all believed as children that she had the perfect childhood. That was another lie. Anne Hamilton Byrne's childhood was far from perfect, and the children would also learn this truth years later. Sarah Moore would tell reporters later on that Anne Hamilton's Byrne mother was psychotic, and her father worked on the railways and was absent a lot of the times, and she came from an extremely impoverished and horrible background. So this might explain a little of her obsession with why she wanted to create her very own Von Trapp family, this perfect family, because the family she came from was extremely imperfect. There were also reports of Anne Hamilton Byrne's mother setting her own hair on fire and Anne witnessing the whole thing. So that's extremely traumatic as a, as a child. And back then, that would have been like late 20s, early 30s when Anne was little. Um, you know, there wouldn't, there's no intervention. There was no intervention back then. So anything that would have messed with Anne's very delicate psyche back then would not have been addressed. Her mother would have been put in an institution. And um, I'm not really sure what happened to Anne. That's something I haven't been able to find in my research. But obviously her father came back or she went to a relative on to Leanne Crease would also go on to say, I think she was trying to portray this perfect life and this perfect family because it was something that she didn't have. As an adult, Anne Hamilton Byrne did turn to yoga and began studying Eastern religions. Anne had been quoted as saying, I had been teaching yoga quietly because that was my master's last utterance. I had to start it. That was divine orders. That was my mission. That was the divine vision. I just find that incredibly creepy. I really do. She created a new persona for herself, a new age guru available to those in need of spiritual guidance. But she needed credibility and zeroed in on a highly respected British physicist, British physicist and author, Dr. Raynor Johnson, who had a large following. Sarah would go on to describe Sarah would go on to describe Dr. Johnson as a very kindly old man, very clever, but also very, very, very gullible. So gullible that Dr. Johnson believed Hamilton Byrne when she told him that she was Jesus Christ. Anne had received some inside information after having oh my god. This woman Oh, okay. I'm just going to say it. Anne had received some inside information after having relations with Johnson's gardener. That's the nicest way I can put it. But she pretended to be clairvoyant and poor Dr. Johnson bought it. So Sarah would say what happened at this juncture was she appears at his door in the middle of the night saying she knows that he is going to India with his wife and that his wife is going to get very sick over there, and that she is the Messiah. After that, Rainer Johnson was hers. Convinced Anne was the Messiah, Johnson began sending her referrals, students and friends, and some who were suffering personal crises. 
And in case you were wondering, yeah, Dr. Johnson and his wife did go to India and his wife did get very sick over there. She had dysentery. After that, he was con totally convinced and he would do whatever Anne wanted of him. And that included admitting people who didn't need to be in the mental asylum to the mental asylum. Fran Parker, who was also a member of the cult and one of her devoted followers, would go on to say, This lovely voice answered me. It was an enchanting voice full of depth and love and encouragement. Fran was an early follower. At the time, Fran Parker would say, We didn't think of ourselves as a cult. Everyone there seemed to be on a very similar wavelength. They were just lovely people who were sincerely looking for the spiritual dimension in their lives. Which I would believe. I mean, there are a lot of lovely people who are just looking to be more spiritually fulfilled. Perhaps they're trying to make something better of their lives. And instead of being guided and gently nurtured into wherever they wanted to go, they met Anne Hamilton Byrne. Sarah would go on to say that in Australia, there was a huge interest amongst the upper middle class people in alternative spirituality. Can you see where this is going? Anne Hamilton Burns teaching struck a chord with her newfound credibility. And this was also, and this was also courtesy of her newest disciple, Raina Johnson. She began to attract more and more followers and the cult known as the family came into existence. So the next excerpts that I'm gonna put into the video here come from Lex Deman, the detective involved in shutting down Anne Hamilton Burns' leadership of the cult and Peter Van Zandt, a reporter who interviewed Lex Demand regarding his involvement in bringing down Anne Hamilton Byrne and her incarceration of these children at the cult. So Lex Demand would say the cult was made up of professional people, architects, solicitors, barristers, nurses, professional people in society. Peter Van Zandt would go on to ask him, how do you get someone so smart to do something that the rest of the world perceives as just so stupid? Stephen Eichel would actually go on to answer this question. Stephen would say it's a question that haunts all of us all the time. One can be highly intelligent and very educated and yet have a real psychological naivete. A lot of times people who are really smart and really educated mistakenly believe that they are now invulnerable to any kind of influence. And it is this perception of the self that, oh, I'm book smart, I'm too smart to be conned. And I'm sure Dr. Johnson thought the same thing. Detective Lex Demand says Anne targeted anyone who could help her amass her power and money. She set her sights on Bill Byrne, a successful and married local building contractor. Leanne Crease would put in her thoughts on the matter. I think that he was captivated by her charm just like everybody else was. So Anne and Bill ended up getting married. Oh yeah. Bill divorced his wife and married Anne. They became the unquestioned leaders of the family sharing the new last name which would become known around the world Hamilton Byrne and how pray tell did Anne manage to wrest Bill from his wife she told him that she had a vision of his wife cheating on him and that was all it took Anne's adult followers agreed to live by her rules. Unseen, unheard and unknown. That was the cult's motto. They kept their jobs and congregated on one street, miles from the children's compound. So, 
to me if I was getting interested in something and somebody suddenly starts saying to me oh look you know you, you can't be seen with us you can't talk about us you, you know you, you, it, we've got to be unseen unheard blah blah that would put up massive red flags in my head I would be like right this is weird I'm out of here but she had so much influence on these people they stayed and the cult grew Adam Lancaster, if you remember, we talked to him earlier as well. He's also one of the children who grew up in the cult. In the 70s and 80s, the majority of the family owned the whole street. Anne had a surefire way to keep many of her followers under her thumb. It was the mind-altering drug, LSD. So for the ones that weren't totally convinced, she drugged them. Adam would say, I just remember being in this world of colour purples to pinks to reds to greens to blues it was like as if i'd walked into jelly and what used to happen inside this cult with the children is when they were turning like they were becoming prepubescent coming into their teens around the ages of 12 13 14 and would give these children hallucinogenic drugs she would give them the lsd they'd be locked in a room by themselves for days and just i cannot i cannot even imagine the nightmare visions these kids would have had on this drug i think they were given a little bit of water i don't think they were given any food but they were as soon as they'd start coming off the drug the aunties would come in and they would give them more so this is what was going on in this cult and it was like Anne would be accusing these children who know nothing of the outside world or what's going on out there and what people actually do in the outside world. It's normal. She would be accusing these children, oh, you're thinking about sex, you're thinking about this, you're thinking about that. They would be taken away, locked in a room and given LSD. That's a really dangerous drug. it astounds me that so many of them actually did survive any of this so the family also taught an eclectic mixture of christianity and hinduism and other eastern and western religions and it was all around the principle that spiritual truths are universal the children raised in the group studied major scriptures and all of these religions as well as the workings of gurus including sri chimoy mihi baba and Rajneesh. One adopted daughter, as we've talked before, Sarah Hamilton Byrne, later described the group's beliefs as a hodgepodge of Christianity and Eastern mysticism. And as we said before, this all revolved around the philosophy that their founder, Anne Hamilton Byrne, was the reincarnation of Christ and a living God. So within the group, Jesus, Buddha and Krishna were regarded as enlightened beings who came down to earth to aid humanity with Hamilton Byrne being put in the same category as these teachers. On the basis of this belief, members of her inner circle claim to be the reincarnations, and I can't get over this one, of the 12 original apostles. You cannot make this stuff up. Beginning around 1964, Anne Hamilton Byrne led a religious and philosophical discussion group at the home of parapsychologist Raina Johnson on the eastern outskirts of Melbourne in the Dandenong Rages in the suburb of Fern, Fernie Creek. The group purchased an adjoining property which they named, here we go again with that name, Santa, Santin, named Santinicatan Park in 1968. And I just did a whole heap of that takes, so it took me about six times to say that, that's why I'm not saying it much and constructed a meeting hall called, oh, I've got to say it again now, oh no, Santina Canetan Lodge. The group consisted of middle-class professionals, as we said before, a quarter of whom were medical personnel recruited by Johnson via Hamilton Burns Hatha yoga classes. Many of the members mainly lived in the suburbs of Melbourne and in the townships of the Dandenong Ranges, meeting each Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday evening at the lodge. No, I'm not saying that word again because, oh my God, it's that's a mouthful. They also met at Crowther Lodge or 
in Olinda or on another property in the area known as the White Lodge. By the 1980s, police estimated that Hamilton Burns' fortune was as much as 50 million. During the late 1960s and 1970s, New Haven Hospital in Kew was a private psychiatric hospital owned and managed by Marion Villamick, a family member. Many of its staff and attending psychiatrists were also family members. The family recruited some of the hospital's patients into the group and administered, again, the hallucinogenic drug LSD to both patients and members of the family. This was under the direction of family psychiatrists John Mackay and Howard Whitaker. If the name Whitaker is familiar to you, yes, he is that boy's father who administered the drugs to him at the age of 14. And that's who we're dealing with here. One of the original family members was given LSD, electric convulsive therapy, and two leucotomies during the late 1960s. Although New Haven Hospital had been closed down by 1992, an inquest was ordered that year into the death of a patient in 1975 that was alleged to have been due to deep sleep therapy. The inquest heard evidence concerning the use of electroconvulsive therapy, LSD, and other practices at New Haven, but found no evidence that deep sleep had ever been used on the deceased patient. The hospital was later reopened as a nursing home with no connections to its previous owner or uses. And as you've been following along, have you guessed that it was New Haven that people were committed to if Anne wanted them out of the way if they were going to leave the cold or they were going to rat her out to the police or whoever they would get admitted to New Haven heavily drugged and put nicely out of the way so that Anne could continue her reign of terror so now we move on to the Kailama property now Anne Hamilton Byrne acquired Kailama she also acquired 14 infants and young children between 1968 and 1975, but as we know, it was as many as 28 children. And as we said before, some of the children were biological members of the family and others had been obtained through illegal adoptions arranged by lawyers, doctors and social workers within the group. And they could bypass all the normal protocols so that Anne could get the children she wanted. The children identities were changed using false birth certificates or deed polls. They were all given the surname Hamilton Byrne. And as you've seen by the photos, and I'll put more in here, they were made to dress alike, even to the extent that most had their hair, as we said before, being bleached uniformly blonde. The children were kept in seclusion and homeschooled at Kailama, a rural property usually referred to as up top. And this was at Taylor Bay on Lake Eildon. All were told that Hamilton Byrne was their biological mother, as we already knew. And the other adults in the group were always known as uncles and aunties. And some of them were actually the real biological parents of some of these children. They were denied almost all access to the outside world and subjected to a discipline that included starvation diets and frequent unprovoked beatings and this is just on top of what we talked about before they were given doses of the psychiatric drugs flufenazine diazepam haloperidol chloropromazine trazepam oxazepam trifloparazine carbarazepine or ipramine were frequently administered to the children now, as before we said, on reaching adolescence, they were compelled to undergo an initiation process involving the LSD. And while under the influence of the drug, the children would be left alone in a dark room, all alone apart from visits by Anne Hamilton Byrne or one of her psychiatrists from the family. Can't even imagine what that'd be like. Even though um, during my research, I've watched a lot of interviews. I've read a lot of interviews with the kids talking, or they're young, they're adults now, but the children of the cult 
talking about their experiences and my goodness, I still can't even fathom what they would have gone through at the hands of Anne Hamilton Byrne. And for her to sit there as we saw before and say to that reporter, oh, I didn't hurt anybody. Wasn't me, I didn't do anything. Honestly, she makes my skin crawl. She really does. And I know she's deceased now, but she still makes my skin crawl. I'm just gonna say it, what an absolute disgrace of a person. So for several years, Hamilton Byrne developed a connection with the Siddha yoga movement, receiving <laughs> all these weird words, it's so hard to say. Shak Shaktipat initiation from Swami Maktanda and taking the Sanskrit name Ma Yogi Shakti. In 1979 and 1981, she took some of the children to stay with Mak Maktananda. Okay, I probably said this dude's name wrong before. These are hard, they're really hard to pronounce. 1981, she took some of the children to stay with Maktananda at his ashram in South Fallsburg, New York, the United States, and purchased a nearby property as her own base in the USA. Sarah would recall how Maktananda would give a private audience, or Darshan, once a week to the family. He once asked the children if they would like to leave the family and live with him and his Guru Dev Siddha Peeth Ashram in India. The children all gave an enthusiastic yes, but unfortunately were later punished by Anne for disloyalty. According to Sarah, Hamilton Byrne eventually caused a lot of trouble at the South Fallsburg Ashram and some of Makatananda's devotees defected to the family. So she's gone in and she's infiltrated somebody else's this ashram that what sounds like a pretty nice and fairly normal person was running she's taken some of his followers and then she's punished the children for saying that they wanted to, to go stay with him because they were so terrified and abused by Anne and her aunties this woman oh she's a piece of work she really is. So Sarah was actually present when Swami Tijo Mayan was initiated into the family, later saying that she could not understand why he would want to join a sect where everybody was so miserable when it seemed that everyone around Maktananda was always so happy. We're coming up to the part about the police intervention. And believe me, there was a lot of awful things happening to these children in between. They were, they were being left outside, they were being beaten, they were being waterboarded, they were being drugged, they were being starved. As in one interview I saw, one of the children was just failing to thrive and she didn't talk until she was five years old. If Anne thought these kids were putting on one single ounce more than they should, they'd be denied food. And they were only given very, very small amounts of food. And these are growing children, you know, and they need their calories, they need energy to grow, they need to be able to play. And these children were denied all of that. And it just amazes me that most of them survived into adulthood. I just, wow, the resilience. So in 1987, Anne Hamilton Byrne actually expelled Sarah from the group because of arguing and rebellious behaviour. So with the support of a private investigator and others, Sarah, and Sarah is so courageous, she then played an instrumental role in bringing the family to the attention of the Victoria Police. As a result of Sarah's efforts, a raid took place on Kai Lama on the 14th of August 1987, and all children were removed from the premises. Sarah would later go on to study medicine and become a qualified doctor. She learned about her adoption and eventually, as I said before, did meet her biological mother and spent time with her. After the raid, Hamilton Byrne and her husband left Australia for a period of six years. Operation Forest, an investigation involving police in Australia, the UK and the US, resulted in their arrest in June of 1993 by the FBI in New York City. 
This followed admissions by former members of the family, including the group's solicitor, Peter Kibbe, that the group had engaged in adoption scams, including acts of forgery. Hamilton Byrne and her husband were extradited to Australia and charged with conspiracy to defraud and commit perjury by falsely registering the births of three unrelated children as their own triplets. Charges that were unfortunately later dropped. Elizabeth Whitaker, the wife of Howard Whitaker, was their co-defendant. Hamilton Byrne and her husband pleaded guilty to the remaining charge of making a false declaration and were fined $5,000 each. And as I said before, that was mere pocket change to the Hamilton Burns. The conspiracy charges against Whitaker were dropped, but she was convicted of falsely obtaining nearly $23,000 between 1983 and 1987. Other members of the family were also tried at court. Margot McClellan, aged 64, was convicted of falsely obtaining $28,000 between 1978 and 1988. Joy Trevelyan, aged 56, was convicted of falsely obtaining over $38,000 between 1979 and 1988. Helen Buchanan, aged 49, was convicted of falsely obtaining almost $15,000 between 1980 and 1987. In 2009, two individuals received financial compensation from Anne Hamilton Byrne after suing her. Uh, she wasn't just going to do it out of the goodness of her heart. Please don't think that. Her granddaughter, Rebecca Cook Hamilton, had sued for an alleged psychiatric and psychological illness, alleged malnourishment and cruel and inhuman treatment by Hamilton Byrne and her followers. Her award was estimated to be at $250,000. Another former member of the family, Cynthia Chan, alleged that she had paid the, that she had paid the sum of three hundred and fifty-two thousand one hundred and fifteen dollars to Anne Hamilton Byrne for real estate in Olinda, but the property was never transferred to her. She also alleged that she paid the sum of seventy thousand four hundred to Hamilton Byrne for another property, but this too was never transferred to her. Hamilton Burns said she had no memory of the transaction. Of course she did, because she always tells the truth. We saw that in the interview, didn't we? Chan's judgment was estimated at $250,000. In the aftermath, Hamilton Burns' husband, Bill, died in 2001. She attended the funeral in her only public appearance following her conviction. In later years, it was reported that Hamilton Byrne was living in a Melbourne nursing home and suffering from dementia. And that an internal succession crisis for leadership of the group was unfolding. In an interview with the ABC local radio in Ballarat, Ben Shenton, as we spoke about Ben earlier, a former adoptee of the family, said that the group had become a toothless tiger. Sarah Hamilton Byrne unfortunately died in 2016, aged only 46. Anne Hamilton Byrne died on the 13th of June 2009, aged 97. In 2016, a documentary on the sect entitled The Family was released at the Melbourne International Film Festival and was written, directed and co-produced by Rosie Jones. Companion book, The Family, The Shocking True Story of a Notorious Cult was written by Chris Johnston and Jones and published by Scribe in 2017. Jones later released a three episode miniseries, The Cult of the Family in March of 2019. The 2019 novel In the Clearing by J.P. Pomar is a fictionalized account heavily based on the family and it was turned into a 2023 TV series, The Clearing, which was produced for Disney Plus and stars Teresa Palmer, Miranda Otto and Guy Pearce. And I actually have watched The Clearing. Um, I watched it, honestly, when I watched it, I didn't realize at first what it was about, but as, it progressed I realized that yes this was the miniseries that was produced based loosely around Anne Hamilton Byrne and her family cult and loosely 
yeah, loosely, I don't know if I would say loosely because if you're familiar with this case and you want to go and watch The Clearing on Disney+, Plus, you will recognise everybody in it in an instant, especially Guy Pearce and Teresa Palmer's characters. And it was, yeah, followed along pretty closely. There were a lot of name changes and a few little things were changed, I guess, you know, because this... It's a fictional series, but it is based on the family. And that is where we will leave this final video for 2023 for Real Crime Down Under. Now, there is reports that the family is still operating here in Australia. I have Googled and searched all that I can on it and I cannot find anything on it. So obviously they are still operating under the don't be seen, don't be heard, don't talk thing. But if there are any updates at all regarding the family and what they are up to these days, I'll be sure to let you guys know in a follow-up video. As always, thank you from the bottom of my heart for my first full year on YouTube. I just passed a year on YouTube. I think it was back in June, July, somewhere around then. And it has been uh, an amazing year indeed. A lot's happened. Um, the, the channel's changed up a few times. I also have a second channel now that I've just started for scary story narrations. So I'm excited to get into that for next year. And I'm excited to sprint to the finish of 2023 and go into 2024 with all of you guys for more of your favourites that I produce for you guys on this channel and for a few new things as well. Uh, it's going to be a massive year in 2024 and I'm so happy that you're all going to be coming into it with me. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and please go watch something happy, something you can enjoy after you've experienced the horror of Anne Hamilton Byrne and her cult. And I will see you all again very soon. If I don't get another video out before Christmas, Merry Christmas again, and I will see you very, very soon after Christmas. Have a wonderful time, everybody, and stay safe. Love to all of you and your families. Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season if you're celebrating. And uh, I will see you all again soon. Bye.